Since the beginning of life itself, our ancestors have left us the ultimate legacy, their DNA. But lately, even that is subject to change, as we can now pre-select the genetic code we bestow on our kids. Recently, I had to sign a form promising I wouldn't have sex with my wife. Why? <laughs> it was because we decided to have a baby. <laughs> Let me rewind. Back to the only time a mullet was considered an acceptable haircut. <laughs> the 1980s. Here we have Philip, a young and carefree man in his mid-twenties. Philip was working on a sand dredge, mining silica in the waters of far north Queensland. After every shift, Philip would leave the dredge with the other miners along these narrow planks back to solid ground. But when Philip started the night shift, he was getting a blinding, starry-eyed effect. While the other men joked and laughed across the planks, the supervisor was shocked to see Philip crawling on his hands and knees, unable to see. Fearing his eyesight would get worse, Philip decided to leave his job and return to Sydney to try and discover what was happening with his eyesight and if there was anything he could do to fix it. He saw many specialists, including ophthalmologist Dr. Frank Halliday. Dr. Halliday did extensive tests on Philip's eyes and, suspecting a genetic link, helped map Philip's family tree, collecting over 400 blood samples from Philip's relatives. Ultimately, Dr. Halliday concluded that Philip had a form of retinal dystrophy, that he would continue to lose his eyesight, there was no cure, and in time, would go completely blind. This happened within five years. At just 30 years old, Philip was declared legally blind, the same age I am now. Philip retrained to become a massage therapist, a job he could do with his hands without his eyesight, he also became a father to a daughter he named Haley. 28 years later, I married Haley. Philip is my father-in-law. When Haley and I decided to get married with the hope of starting our own family one day, we sought advice from genetic experts because we knew that Philip's condition may be hereditary. By coincidence, the genetic counselor and scientist we first saw were actually students of Dr. Halliday, knew of the case, and were amazed to discover Philip's daughter walked through their door nearly 30 years later. They confirmed that Philip's condition was hereditary. And a team of genetic experts from Sydney and the UK helped analyse Philip's DNA in order to find the mutation that had caused his blindness. DNA is made up of four base letters, G's, C's, T's and A's. They were trying to find the one letter difference among these letters. And to give you some perspective, that's two million more of these pages among the three billion. They said it would take months to find, and it did. But amazingly, they found it. Dr. Halliday's previous research, coupled with data from a distant relative in Perth, who also carried the disease, was invaluable in finally giving Philip a definitive diagnosis for his condition. This condition was called retinitis pigmentosa. It's an X-linked hereditary disease where men are usually affected and women are carriers. With symptoms that can occur at any age, it causes the degeneration of the cells in the retina, resulting in complete loss of sight. Haley was confirmed as a carrier. We suspected this. But the unexpected was when we heard, and I still remember the moment clearly, it was one of those moments where time seems to stand still, because we were completely unprepared to hear the news that she too may begin to lose her eyesight. This all happened a month before our wedding. And I can tell you, there's nothing quite like that to add that little bit more stress to the wedding planning. <laughs> 
I'm in awe of Hayley. She took on this news with determination and courage. Despite being worried for our future, how much harder would it be to have a baby to raise children if she lost her eyesight? She was also worried for me, more than usual. She was worried so close to our wedding. Was this still the future, the life that I wanted? Well, she wasn't getting away that easily. I would support her no matter what. We would one day hopefully start a family and we would do it together. As a young, otherwise healthy couple, we were told that we should have no trouble conceiving naturally. But if we did, we had a one in two chance of having a daughter that was a carrier, like Hayley, and a one in two chance that a son would be affected by the condition like his grandfather, Philip. Our genetics team at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital gave us a number of options. One, flip the coin, conceive naturally, and hope for the best. Two, conceive naturally, test for gender at 12 weeks, and with the option to abort a male. But there was also a third option, as they were now able to locate the mutation. They said it was possible to build a genetic test to identify the affected gene in an embryo. We had a choice to avoid passing on this gene by proceeding with IVF, in vitro fertilization. Combining Haley's eggs, the largest cell in the body, and my sperm, the smallest cell in the body, analyzing the resulting embryos and only transferring one that did not carry the condition. This procedure is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD, because I'm not sure I can keep saying pre-implantation <laughs> genetic <laughs> diagnosis. So PGD involves creating a number of embryos through IVF in a lab. Three to five days after fertilization, as the cells begin to divide and multiply, one or two cells are removed from the outside of the embryo, not the inner cell mass that will make the baby. These cells are then tested for any abnormalities, of which they said they could give us 99% certainty. We were excited. This is close to a cure that we could hope for. But we had questions. By undertaking embryo selection, would we be labeling Philip's life as something undesirable, something to be avoided at all costs? We made sure to get his honest point of view. While Philip often downplays his condition by saying things like, by not having to turn the lights on, he saves money on electricity, <laughs> he was uncharacteristically serious when he told us that he would give anything he had for our children to have their eyesight. He said, if there was any chance that we could avoid passing on the disease, then we should take it. In the past, there was not much a couple could do when confronted by a genetic disease, other than do nothing and hope for the best. Thus, the idea of harnessing technologies to change our future is a powerful one. As PGD involves analyzing and selecting healthy embryos, it's giving hope to couples recurrent miscarriage, advanced maternal age, and couples with recurrent IVF implantation failure. It's also giving hope to couples with a chromosomal or genetic abnormality in their families, diseases like retinitis pigmentosa, Tay-Sachs, or cystic fibrosis. Diseases that can cause immense suffering, that debilitate, or that can kill a child before they reach preschool age. With PGD, a couple now has a choice in taking steps to try and ensure a healthy pregnancy, a healthy baby, and avoid passing on a genetic disease forever. But there's also a fear that PGD might be just the thin edge of the wedge, arguably leading to the creation of designer babies. This fear was once only in the domain of science fiction as famously depicted in the 1997 film, Gattaca. Gattaca depicts a future society where embryo selection has led to a eugenic dystopia, where people conceived in the traditional way are considered vastly inferior to those who begin life 
in the lab. As PGD involves discarding or indefinitely freezing embryos, there are many eth ethical issues, conflicting views, and moral stances surrounding it. Recently, there has been much controversy on using PGD on otherwise healthy embryos and selecting them purely on the basis of late-onset diseases, like Alzheimer's, susceptibility to certain cancers, gene matching to, in order to create a donor child for an older sibling, and perhaps most controversial of all, non-medical gender selection or physical or aesthetic traits like hair or eye colour. A line from Gadigal. What first began as a means to rid society of inherited diseases has become a way of designing your offspring. The line between health and enhancement blurred forever. The distinction for Haley and I was that this wasn't about wanting to have a child that had eyes that were blue, but wanting to have a child that had eyes that could see. So we decided to use the technology that was now available, PGD, the preventative measure. It followed your typical IVF procedure. Twice a day, for two weeks, I would help Haley with the hormone injections to make her super ovulate. But instead of producing one egg that month, she would produce 16. That's why I had to sign that no-sex form. Because if she got pregnant naturally, well, I'm still not sure why she didn't want to become double octo-mum. <laughs> As the weeks went by, we had every hope that the process would be a success. But after reaching the first round of embryonic testing, the news wasn't good. Four embryos had made it to the testing stage, but none were fit for transfer. Among these was an otherwise healthy but affected male, sure to develop retinitis pigmentosa and would be discarded. Our faith in the process began to waver. Had we made a mistake? Had we allowed a chance of a life to be discarded, a baby that was so wanted? We struggled with these thoughts far removed from the original hope and excitement that we shared when we first decided to have children. As anyone who has been through it will tell you, IVF is long and arduous and a fraction of the fun of conceiving naturally. <laughs> the thought of having to do it all again with the tests, the needles, the hormones, the mood swings, and that was just me, <laughs> the clinical white walls, the many anxious months waiting, and the possibility that it might all happen again was daunting. But this is the burden faced by any couple wanting to use PGD. As another one of the hurdles we face was how we're going to afford it. It's financially debilitating. After the unsuccessful first round, we'd already used all our life savings. But we couldn't give up. We had chosen this path to ensure that our child had the best chance of a life without an inherited disease. If we do another attempt, we would have to borrow. So we did. And we went in for a second round. But this is the burden faced by any couple predisposed to a genetic condition using PGD. A major issue is affordability, equity of access, and lack of government support. In, a, in the most recent application, to the, Medi the Australian Medical Services Advisory Committee for the public funding of PGD. It was made clear that PGD is not to reduce the number of individuals deemed costly to society, nor to diminish society's willingness to care for those with a disability or genetic abnormality, but there is an important clinical need for PGD in guiding reproductive decision-making. Ask any parent what they wish for their children, to be healthy. This is exciting. The future is brighter for these couples facing hereditary disease. That's why I don't think it should be only for those that can afford it, excluding many others that really need it. Science will also keep progressing. As we draw nearer to the possibility of editing our own genes, we need to consider and talk about 
genetic technology's implications now. How we use it ethically and responsibly, especially for the health of a child, not the type of child. I believe that we should encourage and support people's reproductive autonomy. Using the effective framework of counselling, information and conversation. PGD has given us an option where couples only often had a bleak outlook before. But I don't think it should be for anyone that could afford it. PGD is giving couples the ability to choose to end an hereditary disease. I think we should give every potential parent that choice. Finally, an update of the second round. We've got a healthy embryo. In fact, it's the one I showed earlier. We transferred that successfully, and Haley is pregnant. <laughs> So, fingers crossed from here on out, and then the rest is easy, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you very much.